So let me continue with the introductions of the panel. Um, so uh, I won't repeat the introductions for Rick and Mary, which uh, Angela has uh, nicely done. Let me introduce our two content partners for the event, uh, Mr. Lauris Lepa uh, for Cobalt Latvia, and um, importantly, Alma Angotti from Navigant. And uh, thanks a lot for coming all the way from Washington uh, for, for, for the day today. And we will have uh, Mr. Richard Richard Chambers joining us a bit uh, later as his flight um, has been uh, delayed from the Institute of Internal Auditors um, from Florida. So with that, um, let me um, pass it on to Rick for an introductory presentation. Then we are looking for an engaging discussion, including the questions from the audience. Well, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I think uh, the introduction that I've just got a minute ago reminds me of some talks that I've given in the past when I was the head of the Financial Action Task Force. Uh, and uh, we we're talking about these types of issues, tone from the top and culture of compliance. And some members of the audience uh, suggested to me that uh, uh, I and my colleagues in the FATF at the time were both uh, the source of uh, some employment, but also the cause of a lot of misery for compliance officers. Um, I say that because when I started off as a, a young prosecutor and investigator 25 years ago, um, the issue of money laundering was somewhat uh, esoteric. It was something that uh, meant if you're working with the police, you follow the crooks. Sometimes you get the money, sometimes you lock them up. Otherwise, move on with life. The issues these days are far different. Uh, because the culture of compliance doesn't mean just the culture within a financial institution. It means a whole gamut of concepts these days. So let me try to explain that to you in a way that has become real for me over, over many years. The culture of compliance and the tone from the top really means that the international standards that now apply in terms of money laundering are, re are not just words, they are actual uh, necessities. Why do I say that? Because there's a convergence happening in the financial world. A convergence on the side of uh, corporate governance, uh, anti-corruption, uh, tax uh, standards and anti-money laundering. And you'll see if you uh, cross that, uh, those thresholds of those four areas that financial institutions, as well as many arms of, of government and the international bodies that are responsible for those standards are applying across the board similar concepts. In particular, for example, beneficial ownership. I assume that most of you in the room are from banks and are from compliance areas of banks. Can I have a, a, just a quick show of hands? Who here is already struggling with the issue of, for example, beneficial ownership and identification? Could you indicate? Yes. The rest of you are shy. I'll take that as a 100% example. Um, why am I concentrating on this? <clears throat> it's because, by way of example, uh, when I first started this type of work, it would have been inconceivable that someone such as the managing director of the International Monetary Fund would have attended uh, a meeting on anti-financial crime and money laundering. That happened earlier this year when uh, Christine Lagarde came to the Financial Action Task Force meeting for the first time and laid out what the IMF's principles were in relation to financial crime and anti-money laundering. The same thing with the World Bank. The same thing with the heads of uh, other agencies and international bodies whose job was previously nothing to do with crime and nothing to do with uh, anti-money laundering. Why is that happening? It's because the very fact, not so much just the crime, not so much terrorist financing, important as though they are, and, and why this effort is aimed at identifying, detecting, and stopping uh, the proceeds of crime, proceeds of, of terrorism going through the system. But it undermines the stability and the reputational uh, uh, the reputations of the financial institutions. And, and by that, it undermines the whole concept or the whole uh, perception of
of the stability of the financial uh, world. Now, that's a big statement. I wouldn't have made that statement about five years ago, but I think I can confidently make that statement now. Because if you look at uh, the uh, numbers of countries and the reasons why they're involved in anti-financial uh, crime, and particularly anti-money laundering and terrorist financing, one reason is obvious, because the problem is urgent, especially on the anti-terrorism and terrorist financing side. The other is that there are interconnections across the globe now. Again, when I started this type of work, it was mostly national work, uh, some international connections, usually stopped at borders because you couldn't get responses to mutual legal assistance requests or other types of, of in international cooperation. So the Financial Action Task Force standards have now uh, crossed over the threshold of what, me what it means to tackle financial crime, which is an international corporation. And what does that mean in, in practical terms? Well, it really means that every country is now, to one degree or another, interdependent <clears throat> on one another in terms of fighting this, this issue. And if uh, it's not done on a global scale, it leaves weak links and vulnerabilities. And one of the reasons that the FATF and other bodies who conduct evaluations of countries uh, are involved in this is that the international cooperation aspect and the flow of information within and between financial institutions is crucial to this fight. So you all probably are aware that uh, Latvia is currently under uh, examination by MoneyVal as part of the FATF uh, group of, of uh, organizations. And that report will come out in, uh, uh, I think, September next year or something like that. Um, why is that important? Well, it's, it's because I'm not going to stick to my script here. You'll see some concepts on the board, but I'll just speak to a few of them. Why is that important? It's because as part of the international efforts, every country undergoes the same examination. The same standards are applied, the same methodology is applied, the reports are public, and the consequences of having a bad report are unhappy ones. So there's both a carrot and a stick approach that the international standards apply. One is uh, the reason why this effort is important is inscribed in the standards. And, and what is this effort? What does it mean? Does it mean uh, tick the box exercise of compliance? Or does it mean attempting to actually stop the problem? Well, it, it means the second, it means the latter. Because again, uh, I don't want to bore you too much with my own personal experiences, but in the past it was a tick the box exercise. The FATF and now the Global Forum on Tax out of the OECD, which uh, every country uh, is, is in one way or another affected by, are applying a, a mutual evaluation examination system, <coughs> excuse me, where the issue is no longer one of whether you have uh, the tools in place, whether there are technical compliance, whether you tick the boxes of whether you have a financial intelligence unit or you have suspicious transaction reporting requirements in the law, but whether or not the system is actually working effectively. And how is that done? There's a methodology to determine that. But what it means in practice, in simple terms, is that it's no longer a, a litany or a list of whether you have ticked the boxes of legislation, which is important, of course, you have to have those tools, or whether you have the infrastructure in place, such as financial intelligence unit, such as the reporting requirements of compliance officers, and such as the need for uh, reporting entities to be mandated by law to make such reports. But it means these days, what result is that achieving? Is it actually delivering on what the technical requirements have put in place as a fundamental building block? And I have to say, the, the results so far are mixed. There have been about 35 countries examined so far. There, uh, some of them have got good results, some uh, medium results, and some very low results. 
Uh, for example, in the important area of beneficial ownership, even though uh, the United States, for example, or Canada, uh, have largely good systems, they're very poor on beneficial ownership. And that shows in the results. So there's a mix of results so far in terms of examination. Uh, but what the point that I wanted to make to you in relation to what happens when a country is examined and when the report comes out is, are there consequences? Well, yes, and what kind of consequences? One is that there's follow-up uh, in terms of the, uh, the results. So no country, uh, if I can use blunt language, escapes the system. Uh, what it means is that where there are deficiencies identified in a report, and this is going to be particularly important for financial institutions, uh, if the deficiencies are, 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 are clear, will be that the, the, country, the country, including the financial institutions subject to the law in a country, will have to report back to the FATF, in this case, in, money, in your, your case, Latvia, to the, the MoneyVal organization, on how those uh, deficiencies have been uh, rectified. And if not, there's continuing monitoring. That's one consequence. The other is uh, an effect on reputation. Uh, and that one is uh, out of the hands of the FATF, but it has a commercial effect and it has had in many instances around the world. No one wants to have, as a country, a poor reputation. No financial institution wants to get into the situation, I think, of, of having a poor reputation that causes not only governmental involvement uh, in, in, in uh, the work that you do, but in terms of the clientele and in terms of who's prepared to do business with you, in terms of whether correspondent bank relationships are going to be negatively affected, those kinds of practical concerns. In addition to that, some of the consequences of uh, uh, a poor result and a poor reputation, if that's the case in some countries, is that uh, they uh, will potentially go on what the FATF refers to its, as, its inter, as its international cooperation re review group list, a long term for uh, a public naming and shaming list. This is one of the consequences that's potentially uh, available and has been used and is being used by the FATF uh, and MoneyVal, of course. And that brings with it uh, very significant reputational and commercial consequences. So I don't mean to paint a bleak picture here because I have no idea what the result of the Latvian evaluation will be like uh, and don't intend to speak to people about that. That's no longer my job. But rather to paint you a picture of why the issue of anti-financial crime, anti-money laundering is no longer one just for as uh, perhaps Americans might say, Alma, forgive me if I can use your country as an example, it's no longer just a cops and robbers exercise. It's one that requires an involvement of the financial institutions very uh, uh, deeply, and it's one that's moved from a situation where financial institutions are asked not just for information, but actually uh, are asked to participate in trying to determine determine and, and deter the financial crime and terrorist financing threats that countries and the world have. We will move on a little later to discussing issues about what that might mean in practice in terms of information uh, flows and sharing between financial institutions and between the government and financial institutions. But let me just say here at the beginning, I'm trying to set out for you uh, how the uh, world has changed very much in the last 10 years in terms of financial crime. So my view now from the experience I've had from hundreds of people I've spoken to in financial institutions and governments around the world is that you as financial institution staff, particularly compliance officers, are no longer uh, expected just to provide information on demand or in accordance with the law. You have to do that, of course. You have to provide suspicious transaction reports and all the other things that you need to do in terms of follow-up, uh, presuming the law permits that. But there is a move now, and it's growing in intensity, that financial institutions should be part of the solution and not be pointed to as potentially part of the problem. And that means in practice that the financial institutions are becoming uh, seen as not just the, the, the uh, possessors of information, uh, 
but people uh, such as yourselves who know who, you, who the customers are or should know who the customers are, who should know what their banking practices are, who should know whether there's something unusual or suspicious and not just file a, a suspicious transaction report but in, in many countries now and I'll give some examples of this a little later where uh, the anti-financial crime philosophy involves the financial institutions and not just the government agencies because uh, you will perhaps see if, you, if, you, if you're bored at night time and want to read on uh, read up on some of the countries who are taking this next step in terms of information sharing that there has been a change in philosophy it used to be the police investigate they seek information they move on these days with money moving so rapidly so easily across the world the law enforcement agencies can't possibly keep up with that. So a combination of effort is required. A combination of effort in terms of not just the information, but the internal intelligence, the internal knowledge and the internal experience that financial institutions and compliance officers have. And to add that to the investigative capacity of a country. This is something that's now happening in, in about 20 countries and it's a growing, it's, it's a growing uh, trend. And I'll describe that a little Little later. So uh, I think this is just by way of introduction. I uh, wanted to leave you with the message that you're not alone. Uh, compliance officers in many countries uh, feel that they're the meat in the sandwich, that they can't satisfy their bosses and they can't satisfy the government either. This is often the case across the world. Uh, that, however, is also changing because the issues that uh, Sander mentioned earlier turn from the top and the culture of compliance is actually now demanding that that not be the case, that the turn from the top means really literally what it asks for. You will see this in many cases now where there have been uh, significant fines of billions of dollars around the world uh, how that has focused the mind of, the, of the, the top managers in financial institutions. And I say that not as an indication of threat, but as an indication of reality. Uh, and why is that the case? It's not simply because there have been breaches of the law or breaches of the standards, but because the whole edifice of financial crime cannot be tackled if the top layers of financial institutions actually mean what they say and do what is required. So I'll leave it like that for a minute, uh, for a few minutes, and hopefully we can have question and answers if there are any in due course. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Rick, for um, a thought-provoking introduction. In moving forward the discussion, I wanted to um, go to Mary as a co-chair of the Nordic um, ACOMS chapter and uh, giving us a sense on how are um, the entities in uh, our neighboring countries dealing with these issues and turning the, the basic premise of tone from the top and uh, that the culture of compliance is needed into <clears throat> practical steps tools and instruments and how do they actually know that the culture of compliance is at an adequate level to deal with the complexities of today. Well, thank you. Um, good morning, all. Um, yeah, it's definitely interesting to, to look at it from another perspective. So when it comes down to the Nordic, we are uh, yet, Nor Norway is still yet to implement the fourth EU directive. The countries otherwise have been doing that. And it's, um, it's a message sent loud and clear from the Swedish uh, Financial Supervision Authority when it comes down to this is absolutely a matter that matters. I'm just going to nod because that is what they are doing. So it's it's absolutely a, it requires efforts and it requires resources. And um, I think that when it comes down to um, the FSA and the the work that they are doing in implementing the the rules and the regulations, it's they have left sort of like the advisory part up to other uh, bodies within the within the countries um, they are not an advisor they are an authority and since the swedish authority in this case is the one who can administer fines it's um and so they have done as well as you probably are aware of there are certain nordic banks that have received some fines lately in, in this matter, so it's um, the tone from the top and the tone from the legislator has absolutely been sharpened, so to speak, definitely. And when it comes down to compliance culture, I think that's um, 
the importance of it has absolutely accelerated. Um, the, the good thing is that in our line of profession, we will never ever stop learning. And so if you want to involve in your career, I think that this is the right career move to be in <laughs> because you will absolutely have to stay on top on everything from legislation down to, to, to ethics. So it, it's um, definitely, it's a loud and clear message. It's serious business and um, it's here to stay and it's here to actually do, do it. Um, efficiently as well. I think that the, the regulators has switched its tone to become, it's all about the how, it's not about the why anymore. The why we probably can, you know, wrap our head around and, and really focus on, but it's how you do it. So therefore, definitely uh, a different set of tone. Mm -hmm. And the bar has been set quite high. But then again, we should remember the purpose, right? purpose of what we are doing this. It's about financial crime, it's about actually stopping terrorists, it's about stopping blocking and um, transactions that might be suspicious. So if you come back to that, the how is then, you know, what we need to focus on. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. I, um, we, we now have on the panel what one can call second line of defense, a gatekeeper, and a fourth line of defense. So I'll proceed with, uh, with the discussion in that order. So I wanted to ask uh, Richard to share with us the, um, the tools and the techniques that you're currently discussing on, on the side of the um, Institute of Internal Auditors. Uh, how is the, the, the role of the internal auditors morphing and, and the role that you expect um, and see already taking in, in uh, checking the compliance programs and how to think about that. Sure, thank you very much. Do you move up? Yep. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, first let me apologize for being a bit tardy this morning. Uh, a little confusion on my schedule. I arrived here at 2 a.m. this morning flying back or flying here for the first time uh, from the United States. So I apologize for uh, being a, a couple of minutes late. Um, compliance has become, uh, well, culture, I think, first, has become uh, such an important topic uh, for internal auditors in the last three years, uh, mainly driven by uh, the regulators, uh, regulators in the uh, UK and in the United States and other countries have said that uh, internal audit should include in its, um, in its portfolio of risks uh, the culture of the organization and they expect to see internal audit looking at culture and that in financial services that would involve you know all aspects of culture risk culture and certainly compliance culture uh, when we think of culture um, that there are a lot of very uh, sophisticated definitions a lot of uh, academic definitions but the one that I tend to subscribe to is a very simple one it's how things are done around here and if you think about how things are done uh, in any organization, particularly in a financial services uh, institution, you can start to think about uh, that uh, sometimes things are done expeditiously, uh, simply to save time, uh, not to have to uh, delay uh, the outcome of uh, some project or initiative, um, or sometimes, as you've alluded to in the earlier conversation, uh, things are done uh, because there's some sinister motive. Uh, what we see internal auditors doing is starting to get, wrap their arms around this concept of auditing culture. And my advice to them is not to start by trying to do some enterprise level audit of culture, um, but rather to assess culture in every audit that they undertake. When an internal auditor is undertaking an audit and finds, for example, that there is a failure in some aspect of compliance, a regulation was not complied with, or some other compliance of uh, non-compliance issue, then the internal auditor has an obligation to find out what the root cause of that non-compliance is. And, and I think for me, the, the interesting thing is very often, uh, if you really start to, to go to the ultimate root cause, you will find that it isn't done because people didn't have time or because they didn't uh, understand the regulation or the, the, the policy. It's often done because uh, the ends justify the means. Often they are uh, assessed or evaluated or remunerated based on what is accomplished and not how it's accomplished. 
Uh, we look at, uh, for example, the big banking scandal recently in the United States, Wells Fargo. You could very easily say that much of what went on in Wells Fargo with these accounts and opening accounts and the names of customers who were not aware of them, much of that was was the ends justifying the means, that goals had been set for how many accounts would be opened, and that ultimately that's why a lot of these accounts were opened, is that that was the expectation. So when it comes to compliance culture, um, I always uh, urge uh, uh, internal auditors to make sure that they're looking at root cause when they find an uncompliance issue. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Thanks. Let us move to um, Loris. Uh, as uh, as I labeled you as a gatekeeper for the purposes of this discussion, but really giving us a sense uh, from the um, attorney at law working in Latvia and having dealt with a lot of ethics and morale issues. Um, how do you see um, the the issues around the culture of compliance uh, and in in response to the AML regulations penetrating? Um, thank you, Sander. And I'm certainly very pleased to be in this distinguished panel, perhaps being one of a bit, bit of an outcast, not being from the banking and finance industry, but closely working with banks and uh, financial institutions, including the new fintech uh, companies that are currently not yet regulated, but of course obs observing a lot of that the regulated market is currently dealing with. Um, you may know, most of uh, people gathered here may know that uh, the last couple of years the banking industry had um, spent a lot of uh, very hard time and efforts in uh, changing the existing models, um, systems, procedures, standards that had been existing in Latvian banking system for the recent 20 or so years. And um, insiders could even call it um, as a revolution, which might have not been visible to people from outside, to media, uh, luckily enough. But of course, when we think about events uh, of magnitude, to call them revolution, we need at least two um, necessary preconditions. One is that uh, there is an imminent necessity. That is, we cannot live under the existing standards longer. And the other one is, of course, a general consensus, or at least uh, the agreement, the general agreement between uh, all the participants in the market that uh, the changes are necessary. And um, of course, when we observe uh, the events of these past two years, which have been in a radical speed changing the patterns of the existing system, we could say that it's been extremely hard for local professionals for a number of reasons. And uh, primarily, as I would see it also, because I'm wearing two hats, not only the professional hat, but also lecturing in the university, the subject of legal ethics, I see that uh, these efforts have been very hard also because of the fact that we've been living in ethical relativism. That is. It's been quite hard to determine many times, not only for lawyers to see what's right and wrong, but also for the general public. So let me ask you two rhetorical questions. No need to nod or to say anything or to shout out. Where is the thin line between um, evading or tax evasion and tax avoidance? Or could you answer the question, is it a crime to hide money from an oppressive government? provided you've earned the money in a legal way. So questions like these are quite often behind. This is a context in which op the financial institutions operate, and I'm sure not only in Latvia. And under this um, rather difficult environment, uh, rather complex environment, I must say that um, uh, there's another component which is very important, which we also have to take into account, that um, these difficulties happen also because we've used to the concept of, in a way, a rather um, formal approach to rules. And that's based on the so-called legal positivism concept that has been ruling the most part of 20th century uh, in Soviet Union, and of course also in Latvia, because there's a, a famous Russian saying, not poiman nyor, new poiman nyor, which means roughly translating, if you haven't been caught, you're not a thief. So there's nothing to do with uh, concepts of uh, <laughs> legal privilege or concepts of uh, rule of law, but rather whether you've been caught in an act. 
So this formal approach is transforming, and this is a very difficult transformation because when we speak about the term culture, it means not only following guidelines, not looking at the precise instructions, but rather thinking about the consensus of application, the general necessity, the feeling of uh, necessity to, to use these rules. And um, ultimately, I would like to emphasize that um, I have a famous quote, which is in Latvian, but roughly putting into uh, English the words of a rather famous legal practitioner. Um, he said them around 100 years ago, here in Latvia, when it was uh, immediately after restoring, uh, actually establishing our independence. And he said that uh, there's no more vulnerable profession than the profession of law, because lawyers are constantly, on a daily basis, challenged not only by the police and other institutions, but primarily by their clients. And the most vulnerable are the younger lawyers, because they don't yet have a modus operandi. So they don't know the model of approach to legal problems, to legal issues. And I must now, in a way, rephrase this quote uh, to suggest that nowadays there are two most vulnerable professions, bankers and lawyers, because we are always from the constant threat, primarily, I must say, primarily from our clients. And therefore, I'd like to say, without a pathetic ending, that let's work together, because we can certainly collaborate and help not only by applying instructions, but also uh, helping in implementing the culture of appliance. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Laris. Um, moving on to, um, to Alma, um, now you, you are in a um, particular um, sense probably the most knowledgeable about uh, what has been uh, the, the state of affairs in Latvia as Navigant was overseeing the um, external reviews of uh, 12 uh, banks um, in Latvia uh, over the 2000, uh, 2016. And so with that, um, uh, to the extent you can re refer um, to the overall observations you've seen and also um, maybe commenting on what are the developments uh, that you see across Europe or, or, or in fact the North America where you're um, practicing extensively in terms of what are the tools that are being used f by the boards, by the management to check uh, on the culture of compliance and on how these various ethical problems are resolved. And in handing over to you, I'd say that the place where we want to be if you're following the international developments, the, the latest uh, scandal to, um, to evolve gradually uh, from South Africa, in fact, involving not only banks uh, but other other entities, I'd say we definitely would want to be as an industry uh, where Standard Chartered is, where Standard Chartered can nicely say, well, the clients that HSBC continued to serve for three years, we, we were the ones that spotted that something is wrong back in 2014. And so, um, and, and essentially showing that their culture of compliance and, and the decision making in the long term um, proved to be uh, much more positive also in terms of the revenue um, and, and the uh, everything related to this. So over to you. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be here. I'm so pleased to be asked. So um, just to echo what some of the other folks on the panel have said and then to put it back to what we saw when we were doing our reviews in Latvia. The tone at the top, right, is almost always good. The, you, you rarely see a board of director policy that says we don't care about compliance or we don't care about ethics, right? It's, it's always there. The issue is do the business people, right, because the compliance people, that's your job, but do the business people understand that the senior management really means it? That was Richard's point, right? And so, so I don't think that business people want to do the wrong thing. I really don't. Nobody wants criminals and terrorists and corrupt politicians in their institution. The, the, important, the important thing is to educate the business about 
what the risks are, what it's going to cost to do that business safely, and the fact that it's their responsibility. So one of the things that we saw when we were doing the reviews in Latvia in 2016 was the beginning of that process. And frankly, it's still in the beginning of that process throughout most of the world as um, as regulators and governments really are starting to look at what is the business's responsibility? How are they driving this? So how did we see it reflected in Latvia? We saw it reflected in um, the banks taking a hard look at their customer base to coming up with a risk appetite and saying, we want to do this level of business because you have to have some risk in your business, right? Most, you, you can't, you can't do business, especially in international business, without some level of risk. But we saw the banks taking a hard look at what levels of risk they were willing to accept and to exit those customer relationships that exceed that level of risk or where the customers weren't willing to provide the banks with the information they needed to feel comfortable with that level of risk. Another very, and I, I spent most of my career as a regulator and an enforcement lawyer, so I know how they think. Um, we saw the banks in Latvia committing a very high level of resources to this to this process, right? That's where, as we say in the US, we would like to see financial institutions put their money where their mouth is. It's very, it's very easy to say, we really want good compliance. It is very difficult to write a check for a new transaction monitoring systems or sanctions filter. That's hard. Uh, and nobody will ever tell you that especially this area where you're looking for anomalies, where the clients, some of them, it's their job to hide things from you, is not expensive to do well. So we saw a tremendous commitment of resources, both technological resources, but also human resources. Training for staff, because again, people want to do the right thing. You have to let them know, A, what that right thing is and how they're supposed to do it. You have to have escalation paths. So if they're, they see something that doesn't make sense to them, they know where to go. Um, and, and that's not always present in an institution. Um, we saw in Latvia, and you can see it in the descriptions of the Latvian banking sector that we got in our packet today, um, commitments to future enhancements. I was, I was at a board uh, of a European bank giving a presentation to the board on a big remediation effort we were doing, and one of the directors said to me, I don't understand. We had a very clean exam in 2009. Why are we in trouble now? So you, it changes yearly. The risks change. The technology changes. Again, we are trying to find bad people who are deliberately doing bad things. So as soon as we figure out what they're doing, they change. So the other thing that we saw in Latvia was a real commitment to future program enhancements, to understand, and this is, again, by the business, not just you guys, because you know, but to really understanding that this isn't going to be static, that this is going to be a continuing process. And again, a commitment to improve training really across the board, the business, compliance, uh, operations, legal departments, everybody. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks uh, for that. Let me see as we proceed with the discussion if there are any, any questions from the audience. <clears throat> if there are, please uh, step up. Um, then we'll, um, I wanted to pose what can be a bit of a provocative question. So in discussing, um, you mentioned the risks um, that um, are um, inherent in any business. Now the, uh, the national risk assessment um, that uh, we have in place for Latvia clearly identifies that in some areas we have uh, high risks, in some areas moderate risks, but generally inherent risks 
uh, for Latvia, where we are located, are, are fairly uh, fairly high. Uh, and and in terms of the clients uh, and the particulars of the national economy that Laris was alluding to, uh, we can identify that there are high segments. So, can banks? in the current environment manage high-risk clients at all. And uh, how to think about this? Uh, what is the role of internal audit um, in, in, uh, in helping uh, achieve a modus operandi? Um, let us start with that, and then we'll go to what we can call a second line of defense, advisors both to Rick and to Mary. Well, certainly, when we look at internal audits role in any organization, particularly in financial institutions, <clears throat> one of the one of the key missions of internal audit is to provide assurance on the effectiveness of risk management. That is, how how effectively is the organization itself, is the enterprise, managing the the risks, both the high inherent risks as well as the full portfolio of risks, how effectively is management managing those risks? And it starts with internal audit looking at the risk management process itself. So when it comes to compliance, for example, has management uh, adequately assess uh, compliance risks and where those risks are high? Have they designed and implemented um, effective controls? Uh, around them. So when you talk about high, you know, high risk clients, for example, um, I would think uh, that in this day and age, uh, there would certainly be very rigorous uh, controls uh, around, particularly around any, any so-called high risk clients or clients who uh, might uh, potentially be involved in any nefarious activities. So the, the internal audit role is, again, one to assess whether management has adequately identified risks and has adequately designed and implemented those controls. And then that, that assurance that internal audit develops around whether it's compliance risk or any other type of risk, that, that assurance is then provided to management and to the board because uh, increasingly boards and audit committees of boards are turning to internal audit as sort of their eyes and ears within the the enterprise, uh, they're, they're, and and so so are the regulators. By the way, I I uh, I am often s surprised at how vocal regulators have become about their reliance on internal audit. I had a regulator in uh, the United States, I, I show, who shall remain nameless, who said to me last year, they see internal audit as their boots on the ground in the bank, and so. Again, internal audit is just an, one important element of the system of controls, but it is a, a very vital element when it comes to giving boards and others some assurance about how well these risks are being managed. Mm -hmm. Great. So, uh, Rick? Is it on? Yes. Um, well, what was just said in terms of internal audit uh, is in one sense representative also of what I was trying to say earlier in terms of, of uh, risk to particular banks or to banks in general. Um, because certainly I totally agree with, with what was just said in relation to internal audit and uh, the mechanisms that are being put in place in many banks around the world in terms of that as uh, coverage of the general risks that a bank might face or a financial institution might face. In terms of anti-money laundering risk in particular, however, uh, it's not a however, it's a consequence. What are the risks involved in actual uh, dealing with particular types of clients, particular types of products, the geographical location of, of, uh, of people and products that banks offer. What do I mean uh, by that? The whole structure of anti-money laundering is built on uh, two principles, really. One is uh, the, the need for financial institutions to know their clients and therefore to know the risks that go with those clients. And secondly, uh, what to do about that in terms of the law, in terms of investigation, in terms of administrative uh, responses. So the, the, that first principle, if I can put it like that, uh, depends on uh, the risk uh, understanding the grasp of the risk that the financial institutions have. The whole structure is dependent on uh, the FATF standards. Uh, 
ask every country to do a national risk assessment. In addition, though, uh, the, the risk assessments that financial institutions are individually required to do is actually the bedrock of what needs to be done in practice by the financial institution. Because having a picture at a national level is one thing, and it's necessary, and it's vital. In fact, that's the reason why it's recommendation number one in the FATF standards. Uh, and that's supposed to have in it a, a true representation of the risks across the board facing a country, the vulnerabilities and the threats in terms of financial crime and money laundering. But the risks in individual financial institutions vary. Uh, and vary uh, depending on the type of business involved, depending on the type of transactions involved, depending on the type of uh, relationships that you have with, with, with clients. So the, the structure in that sense is based on uh, one thing and one thing only. If the financial institutions cannot show that they have undertaken uh, a methodical and a stringent risk assessment of their clientele, of the product that they offer of their geographical vulnerabilities. For example, I mean, where they lie in terms of neighbors and the, the, the issues that uh, uh, flow across borders. If you can't show that, the regulators around the world uh, will mark you down seriously and there will be regulatory consequences. And if uh, you can't show that and there are consequences, then the, the fines that people are facing in financial institutions are gargantuan these days, and the reputational effect will be uh, very, very serious. So I add that, that broad perspective simply because this stuff is not going away. In fact, over the years, I've seen that the need for financial institutions to conduct uh, rigorous risk assessments internally has increased and is increasing uh, uh, daily, I would say, if, uh, certainly monthly and yearly. But uh, the, the, risk, the risk appetite, therefore, is one that needs to be looked at very, very closely by financial institutions. Who do you onboard? Who, who do you de-risk? And de-risking is a whole other topic perhaps we need to talk about at some point here, but at the end of the day, the onus of the standards and therefore the onus uh, on uh, what financial institutions do in terms of compliance comes back to that, knowing who your client is and what risks they might pose to your business and to the anti-money laundering uh, requirements of your country. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, um, I think it would be... Um Good for me to um, to jump to Alma now. I'm, I'm linking back to the discussion we had as we were um, discussing the the panel and the concept of the risks um, uh, that we are uh, as a, as as an industry injecting into the global um, global uh, financial um, framework. And and if you can talk a bit about that, and then uh, what is it that the partners uh, that are working with us are looking looking, uh, and how do we prove that we've actually reached a certain level of maturity um, that we are talking um, on the same uh, on the same issues in the same way and in the same understanding what's on okay good so thank you um, so it's very interesting I have a lot of also global US bank clients and some of them have been talking to Latvian banks about correspondent banking services. And each of them have been impressed with the level of commitment, with the uh, process of subjecting yourselves to the US standards uh, in, in your, the control reports, because then because it is, it's a big network, it's a big link. So the regulator in the US is looking at Bank of America and JP Morgan and saying, how are you mitigating the risk of all of your banking partners, even your own subsidiaries globally? So the more documented risk mitigation that they can show they have considered throughout their network. Again, remember HSC, HSBC got in trouble for not accurately assessing the risk of its own subsidiary in Mexico. So it's not just 
it's not just banking partners who it, it's all the all the vendor relationships all the banking relationships as well as the client relationships so the more that all of the partners can show a commitment to risk mitigation the more comfortable the other you, the the other participants in this banking network are going to feel um, the other thing i just wanted to say about high risk you there's a lot of high risk business that you can do the problem is i think it can be very expensive because you do need uh, enhanced due diligence report you reports you do need maybe additional monitoring um, one of the things that i've done is uh, I have been the interim chief, deputy chief compliance officer for four financial institutions. Three of them were global for as long as 18 months, right? They get in trouble with the regulator, the poor compliance officer gets fired. And, and I, uh, several times I had the business wanting to introduce a new product. And so often, we do, or a new client segment, so often compliance forgets or it doesn't have the process in place to tell them what that's going to cost to mitigate. So I had one business that wanted to do something and I, I had to tell them I can't monitor that in an automated fashion for a year because the way that the transactions came into the system they weren't identified in this segment. I said so if you want let me hire one person to look at all of these transactions on a manual basis I can you can do it we can do it so you have to make sure that they understand the cost because you can you can do a lot it's just expensive great I think a good segue into having Mary add the perspective on what are the tools and, and how is this discussion evolving in Nordics yeah so um, just coming back to what you said, Alma, you know, the cost of compliance is, 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 is a real issue. So a, a trend we have been seeing in the Nordics is that the banks actually do de-risk. Um, and it's mostly due to they cannot handle the risk of money service businesses. They cannot handle the, the, uh, um, the, the, the cost of um, having the correspondent banking and the controls in place for that to make it efficient as well. So we have been seeing that a trend as well. Uh, but the thing is, when it comes down to de-risking, uh, if you do that on your on the corporate side, that's one thing. But when you're actually starting to do that on, you know, the retail customers and on 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 a level, then you have another problematic when it comes down to financial inclusion, for instance. But. The, the, the trend is that when you buy the monitoring system, you have it in place, it's up and running, and you know the board takes a seat back and says, yeah, okay, we're good, we have a good monitoring system in place, everything is up and running, check, take, take the box, check the box. But you know, it's always you know, involvement, involvement in that as well. So with the cost of compliance, um, you, need to, you need to understand, you know, so this is, this is the product you would like to have, this is the type of segment, the customers, but the cost for compliance actually decreases the profit. So if you can do that in a, you know, in a balanced way, I have found that quite efficient when addressing the, the board and, and the members of, of the, um, uh, the board of directors, yes. But definitely, mm -hmm. it's, it's, um, it's a real issue when, when banks start to do risk because Primarily, that's what we do. That's that's the business. We take risks. Yeah. Actually, as we um, conclude the panel, let me uh, let me see if we have any questions from the audience. Yeah, Ilona. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ilona Gulchik. I'm from Baltic International Bank. It may be not just a question, it may be a comment, uh, a, a reflection on the discussion. When, when we are talking about the compliance culture, uh, I think there is one more aspect about this culture, the compliance culture of clients. Because uh, the level of uh, information they share with the financial institution, the level of the answers they are giving, uh, it really helps managing those risks. And uh, we really are to work on, on, on this issue. Uh, 
with uh, developing the relationship with the clients. Uh, and uh, it is actually going all together this way. Uh, when we talk about the financial inclusion or financial exclusion, uh, it doesn't matter. Uh, uh, it really means if uh, a client uh, is compliant and he can answer the questions, he can submit documents and he can answer uh, on a timely manner that he will be uh, financially included. Uh, it not necessarily means that he is a criminal when he cannot answer the question in a compliant way. So there is still a way to go and it can really help. So uh, maybe you can comment on this, please. Mm -hmm. I'd actually like to um, turn this question to Loris, uh, uh, reflecting again on the discussion we had in the preparation for the for the panel, and also um, the the issue that you mentioned in terms of uh, banks are embedded in the in the culture here, and so how do we look at that, and what do we do with uh, with these issues? Yeah, I just ha had one important note that I'd like to say and perhaps to pose a question. In the world of legal services, we don't have such a concept as a person who will never have a lawyer because that's a constitutional right for everyone to have legal assistance. So my question is rhetorical, perhaps. Can there be a non-bankable client? Can, be, can there be a person who may not be accepted by banks because of the level of risks uh, banks of, or because of the expense of doing the procedures that are required. Um, I, I think, uh, uh, again, similarly, uh, when the bank is built and we think about the the concept of the business to be run by the bank, you certainly are looking towards the ideal type of clients. And in a way, the bank and the clients, they are hand in hand, working together. So effectively, my approach would be that uh, th this is uh, the parallel process to be complied by the bank itself as well as the clients. So it's, it's a matter of collaboration. And it's a matter of, uh, in, in a way, uh, educating each other. I like the concept that was mentioned here, an education. That's a very important element that uh, at least uh, would work in the way how I perceive uh, further sort of way forward. Yes. Okay, great. I can just say something. I mean, this, this also may be an area where we need, and you'll talk about this in the next panel, a public-private partnership. Um, I, I had got a call from a friend of mine at the World Bank who was very concerned when Barclays was exiting the, the Africa money services business because she said, you know, Somalia, Sudan, they rely on remittances for nearly all of their income. It's just going to be a way for the terrorists to move in. And I said, well, then you have to help Barclays, not Barclays, it's Barclays, but you have to help the institutions do this safely. You have to have some kind of association. Maybe you should sponsor the MSB. Maybe the, maybe the World Bank should do that. Maybe uh, there should be safe harbors for very low levels of transactions that are going to very high-risk places. Again, so you, you get the financial inclusion, inclusion aspect. I'm not really worried about the very high-risk South American clients who want to buy real estate in Miami. They'll be fine. But you do, you do worry about about small businesses and individuals who rely on international remittances for their livelihood. So I do think there's a lot of discussion that can happen around that because a lot of banks are de-risking because they don't want to have that difficult discussion with their regulators. Mm -hmm. Good. Rick? Thank you. Um, just in relation to the question or, or the comment that, that you made, um, I think that's a fundamentally important one. And I think uh, it is a question also of uh, an evolution of the thinking of the clientele as well as the banks. Uh, in, in many countries, it's taken uh, many years to go from a position where a client or a potential client comes into these days, people don't come in very much, but used to come in uh, to a bank uh, and seek to open an account and give minimum uh, information, and that was fine. Um, many people, uh, even today, 
you think, why should I give more information? Uh, what business is it of yours? I just want to send some money someplace or, or save some money or borrow some money. Um, so I, I take your point and I think the, the experience in other places, uh, and there are very diverse experiences in many places now have very sophisticated mechanisms in place to explain to clients why this information is necessary. Uh, and if that can be explained in, in, a, in a, a convincing manner, there, there shouldn't be any problem. Uh, if that can't be explained, then it's, I think, a problem for the financial institution not having instruments and practices and training in place to to, to uh, tell the client why this is necessary according to the law and according to other prudential requirements. But if at the end of the day the client, having known that, uh, having been told uh, the reasons, is not prepared to provide the information that the, the financial institution requires to uh, abide by the law and abide by internal principles, then that's a point where you really have to say, I don't think we should be onboarding this client at all. Good. So in terms of looking for agents of change within the industry, the financial sector and, and broader, um, I think that's an excellent segue into the ACOMS uh, chapter launch here, which is one, uh, one aspect of us continuously uh, raising the bar. And that's why we were so honored also to have Mr. Chambers here uh, as the global CEO of the Institute of Internal Auditors. And I would ask you to conclude the panel in terms of how to think about the role of internal auditors as change agents to drive uh, the discussion internally to the next frontier. Well, thank you. And again, thank you very much for the invitation to be a part of the program this morning. Uh, I think one of the, if I, if I look at professions that are undergoing some of the most dynamic change, uh, there's probably no profession uh, that has undergone more profound change in the last 20 years than internal audit. Uh, I've been an internal auditor myself for over 40 years, and I can tell you in the last 20 years, we've seen a real migration away from the internal audit's focus on financial reporting and financial controls to now you see an internal audit function, a well-resourced independent internal audit function that is focused on the full portfolio of risks. And in fact, uh, uh, you know, a lot of people still think of us as the bean counters. Uh, this is a term in English that gets used about internal audit. Um, my, my response to that usually is uh, to today's internal auditors need to know a lot more than how to count the beans. They have to understand uh, how the beans are grown, how they're harvested, how they're taken to market, what the risks are that the beans are going to be stolen, all of those kinds of things. And I would say to you that uh, as you look at internal audit in your own organizations, uh, take, take that perspective that uh, internal audit is charged with assessing uh, the organization on the basis of risks. So you should find the internal auditors where the risks are. This is why we've seen an increasing percentage of internal audit time being channeled into compliance because compliance risks risks have really risen, particularly in financial services in the last 15 years. So think of your internal auditors as, uh, as, a, as a resource to call upon, uh, to rely upon, uh, and uh, to depend upon. And if you're looking at whether or not you can depend on those auditors, uh, look at their own qualifications, their own credentials. Uh, the IIA has the certified internal auditor credential uh, that has now been attained by more than 150,000 auditors around the world. Um, we also have a credential uh, specifically related to auditing and financial services, the CFSA, Certification of Financial Services Audit. So I would, uh, I would leave you with that thought. Don't think of internal audit like you might have thought of it traditionally. Today you're going to find them uh, where the risks are. Thank you.